uh, want to say on behalf of the Journal of Commerce, we appreciate these opportunities to share our experiences, our knowledge of the trade with our sources, and to remind you that we are very much a part of your industry. And I also want to thank uh, Tosca for the introduction. Uh, to set the stage, the Trans-Pacific Trade has experienced 16 consecutive months of record and near record import volumes. And, and Mike, you know, in our long careers in the industry, I've never seen, you know, such a continuous flow of imports month after month without any uh, interruption. So what this means is that there has been established a new baseline of cargo in the East Trans-Pacific. And what that means is that each month, if you compare the volume to the volume, and I'm gonna use the period 2019 and earlier because 2020 was such a, a disrupted year. But if you compare uh, the volumes for August, September, October this year to the same months in 2019, what you see is the baseline has been raised by 20%. So you have to understand this in order to understand the uh, driving force of the congestion and logistical challenges we face is that month after month, we are dealing with a much higher baseline of cargo than we ever have in the past. So um, uh, what are the implications of, for the supply chain? Well, we are seeing vessel bunching, vessels at anchor at a number of ports, the Northwest Seaport Alliance, Los Angeles, Long Beach, uh, Savannah, New York, New Jersey to a degree, uh, just to, to localize it to Southern California, each day now there are about 70 container ships at anchor in the harbor, plus another 26 or 28 vessels at berth. Um, and, you know, Mike, you know the logistical issues that could be caused when you have that many container ships in the harbor. So yeah, they're even they're even drifting at sea at this point. They're drifting and and that's it. There because the route of anchorages. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. The the um, the normal anchorage area is completely oversubscribed. So you have vessels drifting at sea, which you know creates other issues. We'll talk about that another time. Um, a, a much lesser problem, but still a, a challenge in the Northwest Seaport Alliance of Seattle and Tacoma. Um, I, I understand uh, the, uh, the vessels at anchor now are down to about nine uh, from a high of 18 several weeks ago. Um, Savannah, 22 to container ships at anchor. So what we are seeing is um, a situation where the vessels are late leaving because of congestion in those ports. The uh, time to get to the North American um, uh, coastline is therefore set way back. And according to Sea and Tugs Maritime Consulting, on-time arrivals at the West Coast are down to 10%. I mean, how can retailers and other importers plan their logistics schedules if they are dealing in an environment where only 10% of the vessels are arriving on time. And then the major issue today, which I think we're gonna be living with through the peak season, is that warehouses are totally oversubscribed. They are so full that the containers that are drained to those warehouses have to wait three, four days to actually be unloaded. So what happens? They are sitting on chassis in the yards of the warehouses, um, taking those chassis out of useful service. Uh, so it, it's just a problem that compounds upon itself. And then of course, um, 
West Coast sports and specifically uh, Seattle Tacoma are highly dependent on intermodal rail service to the US interior. And the rail yards in Chicago, Kansas City, Memphis, you name it, have uh, been uh, challenged um, much of this year. And it, the situation got so bad that the Union Pacific and BNSF railroads have been metering how many trains they will send to the West Coast ports and back uh, each week in order so to not overload uh, the, the rail yards in the U.S. interior. So what happens, uh, rail containers sit uh, at the ports uh, and uh, contribute to the congestion. So, so Bill, Bill, are you seeing are you seeing a shift from intermodal rail over to long haul trucking, even with the shortage of truck drivers? Are you seeing a bit of a shift there? There has been. My colleague uh, Bill Cassidy on the East Coast uh, covers uh, truck over the road trucking, and yes, uh, not only has there been a shift of some cargo to over the road trucking but it's reflected in sky high trucking rates, uh, which of course add to the um, cost uh, for a lot of importers. But even with that, you know, uh, the, the West Coast ports are so heavily dependent on rail that it, it's only providing minimal relief, if we could even call it that. So the big um, question, which if I can solve it, I will become a multimillionaire, uh, is to predict how long these conditions will last. And the range that is given by the export ex, by the experts is it possibly we may see some return to normality after Chinese New Year 2022, which this year is early, you know, February 1st. And what happens during the Lunar New Year is that factories uh, in China and throughout Asia uh, close for you know, celebrations and parties, et cetera, uh, for a week, two weeks, whatever. And historically, that has been um, the time when terminals in the U.S. can, you know, um, dig out of their backlogs and, and get ready for the upcoming season. So that is the earliest I have heard any of the experts say we're going to see somewhat of a return to normality. Most of them say I about mid-year next year. Um, you know, it's going to take a while to, to clear the backlog and get vessels in the Trans-Pacific back on schedule. So that seems to be the favorite uh, uh, target date is mid-2022. However, you do have pessimists and uh, they are saying we will not see a resolution to this problem until Lunar New Year 2023. So, I mean, the, that's the range that the experts are talking about. And um, with that, um, Mike, uh, I am available for any and all questions. Uh, awesome. I'd like to make one other comment about the, the ship part of this thing. Uh, it doesn't, that doesn't deal with the land side. But we have moved the queue farther out. SSA uh, agreed to put uh, a three-week, four-week forecast out. So vessels coming to T-18 in Seattle um, could make different voyage planning decisions. That is slow steaming, perhaps even stay in China before they depart. And of course, uh, we went from 14 vessels at anchor, plus the four that are drifting around and, uh, and doing uh, racetracks in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, down to one. And then it picked back up again because of heavy weather. You don't want vessels out there in, in, in bad situations. So that has seemed to have um, helped out on the vessel side. LA Long Beach is attempting to put in a, que a new queuing system as well as we speak. Um, we're going through the, uh, you know, crossing uh, the T's and dotting the I's on that and hopefully slow that down so you don't have 77 vessels at anchor or in holding areas today down in LA Long Beach. Want to bring that number way down. So that doesn't help the short, the land side thing. Uh, issues. Um, and as you said, I mean, we have T-18, you know, working one gang against the ship because the, you know, there's 7,000 loaded import containers sitting there and they, they don't have anywhere to put them. 
uh, and, and of course the warehouse situation. So it doesn't help uh, Landside, but um, trust me, we are getting a lot of questions about vessels at anchor and, and uh, in different areas that are at remote anchorages that have been very seldom used. One only been used one time since uh, World War II, for example, and trying to get a handle on all the vessels at anchor hang, hanging around here. Same with LA Long Beach, at, at, you know, as you know. Um, I was just wondering if, if you know, in the beginning, we talked about rail congestion, uh, you know, back east and, and, and the distribution. And then all of a sudden we heard about, you know, warehouses being full. And then we see truck driver shortage uh, articles. If you look at all the issues that they're describing, what would you say the top two or three are right now? I would say the top issue right now is the warehouses. And the reason being that uh, there is a shortage of truck capacity from the back door of the warehouses to the uh, regional distribution centers or to the stores um, you know, in the eastern half of the country. So um, I, I just, you know, there's, it's always kind of touch and go during peak season as far as warehouse capacity and truck capacity. Um, this year, it's a problem on steroids. So you combine the uh, warehouse issues, which include labor shortages there, uh, the heavy volume and the shortage of over the road truck capacity from the warehouses inbound. And if that problem could be addressed, uh, you know, like as quickly as possible, I think the ocean side and the marine terminal side would clear up very quickly. Yeah, I, I, that's great that you say that. The marine terminal here says they're only using uh, um, about 60% uh, of their utilization capacity at the gates right now, and it's because it's stuffed up. If the warehouses get relieved, they can push that stuff out and handle the, handle the ship. One last, I think we have two more questions here, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. Um, this uh, The federal government, and of course, the state of California, and now maybe state of Washington, asking a little bit, what can they do? I haven't seen a lot that they can do. It's a private sector operated supply chain and they're working their way through issues. Have you seen any proposals out of the federal government or state government, state of California specifically, uh, that you think might help? I mean, uh, there's some talk about uh, expediting uh, licensing of drivers and that type of thing, but have you seen anything else? Well, I, I can give you a very quick timeline on that subject. Uh, the Biden administration appointed a port uh, leader uh, John Percari, who was formerly at the Port of Baltimore. And beginning in mid-September, uh, he worked with the ports of LA and Long Beach on a trial program to extend the gate hours in order to give truckers more options for um, taking uh, containers back to the uh, uh, ports uh, and, and you know, taking the uh, delivery of um, inbound containers. That was totally undersubscribed because, uh, you know, their own truckers have to go to sleep at night just like we do. So there just were not enough truckers. I don't think they got, I know for a fact, they didn't get the cooperation uh, that they needed from the retailers keeping their warehouses open 24 seven. So since the, uh, you know, collaborative effort did not work, then that's when the ports of LA and Long Beach came down with the hammer and, um, you know, started these fees. So, um, and, and the good news is that both uh, LA and Long Beach are reporting that the number of long dwell containers on their docks has been reduced by uh, 10%. And this is only in the last couple of weeks. So, okay. Uh, that's directly related to, um, you know, trying to avoid the paying the fees. So, yes, that's, that's very helpful. The state of California um, came out with an announcement about working with the ports to uh, establish more of these off-dock, off um, you know, storage areas, temporary storage areas. So, um, it's, you know, it's the situation where, you know, doing a little is better than doing nothing. And, you know, I think that's where we are right now. I got you. So the, the wrap up question, I think is, um, I, I see maybe a little bit of a silver lining in that the goods movement system is now getting attention. We have struggled for decades to say logistics and goods movement matter, ports matter. 
uh, last mile connectors matter, the whole port infrastructure matters, the gateway projects in Canada, can't we get it together in the United States and invest in our, our, our goods movement corridors? Do you, do you see it that way as well? I mean, if we're going to go through this struggle and now that all this attention, maybe we'll get a, a, a little bit uh, more action around goods movement corridors and those type of things. Wanted to get your take on that. Absolutely, Mike. Uh, um, you know, let's face it, the ports uh, have been ignored by um, the federal government uh, for forever, it, it seems. Because as you said, it, much of this is private sector um, you know, investment and assets and infrastructure. So they, you know, the only time in all honesty, the, the federal government and the general population recognized that we have seaports is, you know, when there was a problem with our contract negotiations. And then, of course, once those were resolved, everybody would forget about it. But the uh, American, I don't have the exact name, but it's something like the American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, every year for decades has been putting out a um, report card on infrastructure in the U.S., freight infrastructure in the U.S., and every year it gets at best a D, sometimes an F. So yes, it is time to at least recognize that we have seaports and to for the federal government to do what it can uh, from its perspective. And what we are seeing now with the recently last week um, passed uh, infrastructure bill uh, that President Biden is signing, uh, that is putting money where it belongs, you know, in infrastructure. And it's all kinds of infrastructure um, that will directly benefit the ports themselves. And then of course the inland move uh, from the ports throughout the uh, networks uh, you know, in the US. So yes, it, it's, to me, it, it's you know, the, some of the best news uh, I've heard That's on this front in a long time. Only good news I can put, put on it there, right? I ordered my Christmas goods four years ago, so I guess I'll get them. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, you'll get them by next Christmas, you know, Christmas no, 2020 no problem. for sure. Well, I'd like to, like to uh, take the opportunity to thank you for taking the time. Uh, maybe next time we can do it in person. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who don't know, Bill, he does a fantastic job doing his uh, uh, research uh, and he's fact-based in his reporting. Really strongly encourage any of those of you that are interested in goods movement, journal of commerce, and look at Bill's articles. Uh, we always find them informative. We do this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in our jobs. We still, we still always read Bill's articles when they come out right away. So very, very, very informative. And so thank you very much. Um, thank Costa, you for I, your kind comments, Mike. Uh, I'm honored. And thank you again, Seattle Propeller Club and the Port of Seattle.